want a war, you're gonna get one. Now get the gun, the trust, the magic. Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the 21st and 22nd of July. Nitro's on a Tuesday tonight, but we'll just compare both shows as normal. WCW presents Nitro from Jacksonville, Florida, while Raw's War takes place in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The WWF bringing Raw to Canada a little more often during this time period was such a great idea. Loads to get through again this week, so let's get started. Nitro opens up with Tony Schiavone letting us know that Ric Flair tonight is going to reveal the newest member of the Four Horsemen, Kurt Hennig is also going to wrestle on Nitro later on, and Hulk Hogan's going to have an opportunity to answer Lex Luger's challenge from last week. Over on Raw, the WWF capitalized on Bret Hart's unique situation with fans in America and fans in Canada. JR talks about how Bret's despised in one country but highly revered in another. And tonight, tensions will be high when the Hart Foundation challenge any three American wrestlers to a flag match. We go to the arena and the fan support for the Hart Foundation is already very apparent. The fans in Halifax absolutely outdone themselves on this night. And this would be one of the best crowds to ever attend a WWF Raw show during this era. We start things off with a Vader vs Ken Shamrock match on Raw while Hollywood Hogan cuts a promo on Nitro. Let's flip over to Nitro and see what Hollywood has to say. Tony Schiavone talks about Hulk winning the world belt last year at Hogwild and he talks about how Hogan, like it or not, still gets a lot of fan attention in 1997. No lies detected. Bischoff and Hogan lay down in the ring, it's incredibly hard to get Hogan to do this by the way, and Hogan says nothing's changed. The reason people are in the building and the reason there's a roster in the back is because Hulk Hogan made it that way. Hogan claims responsibility for wrestling becoming popular in the 80s, and in the 90s, Hollywood Hogan's the man who sets the pace for pro wrestling. Hollywood Hogan will always be the man. Hulk says Lex Luger is just another name, another man who can't lace the Hulkster's boots, and Hogan says he's looking forward to facing Luger. Hulk will break the rack and then break Luger in half, and as a matter of formalities, Hogan says he accepts the Luger match at Road Wild. You know what to expect from Hollywood Hogan promos, and it's not a bad thing. Now we'll see if Luger's got the jam and if he can win the World Heavyweight belt. Ken Shamrock brought some dog food to Raw, he says it's knuckle up time at SummerSlam for Kenny Boy, but it's also chow down time for Davey Boy Smith. Vader vs Shamrock is a rematch from a cold day in hell, but don't expect any live rounds in this one. Shamrock lays in a few kicks and Vader quickly realises that Ken won't be intimidated like his other opponents. A long lockup ends with Shamrock taking a thumb to the eye, Vader gets in a few body shots, Shamrock tries a leg lock but the big man gets in a few forearms and Ken goes down after a short arm clothesline. Shamrock then takes a splash and he has to roll under the ropes, but Paul Bear is standing at ringside and Paul starts hitting Shamrock with his shoe. On the outside, Ken gets thrown into the ring steps and back inside the ropes, Vader wants to end it with a power bomb. Ken fights back, Vader gets stunned, and Ken then pulls off a belly to belly suplex. Ken tries to win the match with a leg lock, but once again Paul Bear tries to interfere. Uncle Paul ends up getting punched in the face, but this allows Vader to take advantage inside the ropes. Vader hits a splash, Ken kicks out at two. Vader tries to finish it with a Vader bomb this time, but Ken gets his knees up. And Kenny Boy then goes for a Frankensteiner, but Vader grabs him and Ken gets dumped out of the ring. Just as Ken was trying to climb back inside, Davy Boy Smith shows up. Our main man hits Shamrock with a running power slam on the rampway. That's how the match ended. Vader wins via countout. It wasn't a great opening match for Raw, but at least Davy seems focused on the task at hand. We'll see him again a little later on in the flag match. On Raw, Brockus cuts a promo for the first time. Did you know that Brockus is the father of Alex Wright? <laughs> he isn't, he isn't. He's speaking German, but he mentions the WWF, the Hart Foundation, and something about his bastard son dancing on Nitro. Brockus is on his way to the WWF, it seems, and don't get your hopes up. 
The Hart Foundation are going to cut a promo next on Raw while Conan wrestles uh, Subasa on Nitro. We also have Steve Regal versus Ultimo Dragon. So who is Subasa? Subasa is the guy who jobbed out to Conan on this episode of Nitro. He'd only been working for around a year at this point in CMLL and this is his only Nitro match. He had spent the majority of his career in Japan and he still wrestles there to this day. I wasn't lying though, he jobs out here in 30 seconds. Conan hits the cradle DDT, we see the tequila sunrise, and Conan makes Subasa head back to Mexico and we'd never see this guy again. Wonderful. Ultimo Dragon and Steve Regal don't even get televised entrances, the two are already in the ring. Nick Patrick showing the TV title to the cameras and the bell rings. Regal controls the wrist to start us off and uh, Dragon takes a back body drop but he no sells it and he performs his kick combo afterwards. I think he was supposed to land on his feet during the back drop but his brain didn't sync up with his body and he just fucking fell. Dragon then tries to catch Regal out with his top rope headstand but Regal's too smart for that shit. Dragon gets slammed to the mat and he takes a few knees to the face. Dragon comes back with a top rope sunset flip powerbomb, the two men then trade strikes before Regal performs an inverted suplex but Dragon manages to get up and the two men trade strikes again. Dragon's able to bring Regal down after a few kicks and he quickly applies the Dragon Sleeper for the win. Ultimo Dragon is once again the WCW television champion. This was a little unexpected and it was also nowhere near as good as the Dragon vs Regal Slamboree match, but not bad, not bad at all. WCW kicking things off with a Hogan promo, a squash match and a title change one after the other. Looks like they were trying to grab attention seeing as Nitro was on a different night. Maybe. Who knows. Hey homeboy. No Saturday Right Favors this week, but you can get a sweet Saturday Right Favor shirt and it make your bratwurst go very big. Visit chinlocks.com today. Yeah baby. The reaction the Hart Foundation get in Halifax is absolutely ridiculous. Even Vince McMahon can't hide how awesome this is as the hitman and his band of merry men stand in the ring, a sea of maple leaf flags and pink and black signs surrounding them. Brett says it's great to be back in God's country. He had a nightmare where he woke up in San Antonio where fans spit and throw stuff at people who tell the truth. And Brett makes an observation. He says the United States of America is shaped like one giant toilet bowl. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he has a point. Brett then tells us why America is shaped like a giant toilet bowl. Because most Americans are just plain full of crap. Brett says all the American wrestlers backstage are hiding, they don't want to step up to the plate, but Brett thinks The Undertaker should get involved in this flag match, so SummerSlam can start early tonight on Raw. Davy Boy Smith is delirious, the lack of chin locks has taken its toll guys. He says the world just saw him quote, slam the most dangerous man Ken Shamrock right through the mat. That's the world's most dangerous man Ken Shamrock and you slammed him on the rampway Davy. Bulldog says more or less the exact same thing as Brett, why wait until SummerSlam, Kenny should accept the challenge and compete in the flag match. Here's Owen, let me guess, Steve Austin we don't have to wait until SummerSlam. Well come on out here and why wait until SummerSlam? Yeah. Remember how we laughed at Psycho Sid reciting Hawk's promo in his head during the King of the Ring? Well Brett does the same but only when Owen says the words kiss my butt. He wants to come out and kiss my butt. Well I don't damn well know he can't kiss my butt. And it's absolute madness. Owen says Austin's a sicko because he's eager to kiss Owen's ass at SummerSlam. Owen isn't going to allow him to do that but if he wants Austin can suck Owen's toes. What? The glass shatters and Steve Austin shows up. He says this isn't God's country, this is a living hell. He'll go down to the ring and stick the Heart Foundation's toes up their asses and he says We ain't got to wait till SummerSlam. I'll hey guys, guess what? We don't need to wait until SummerSlam. Steve Austin confirms he'll take part in the flag match main event. Brian Walsh vs Brian Christopher on Raw. Ric Flair cuts a promo on Nitro. Brian Christopher's been booked on Raw week after week at this point. Brian Walsh gets booked twice per year, if he's lucky. He sucks up to the crowd with his little Canadian flags, but that didn't get him very far. The highlight of this one was Brian Christopher chewing a maple leaf flag and wrestling most of the match with it hanging out of his mouth. It also stuck to his chewing gum when he tried to take it out. Highlight folks, match highlights. Christopher performs the reverse DDT and the top rope leg drop to score the win. 
On Nitro, we were promised an announcement regarding the newest member of the Four Horsemen, and Ric Flair comes out to let us all know who'll be the next man to conduct some serious, serious horseman business. Flair says this decision was made by himself, Benoit, Mongo, and Arn Anderson. Mean Gene says this will be history in the making. The whole wrestling world wants to know who the newest member is, and it's now time to find out. The Horseman's music plays, and Six comes out, wearing an NWO shirt. Flair says Six is once again in the wrong place at the wrong time. Six says there's no fourth member of the Four Horsemen because the Four Horsemen is a thing of the past. Arn Anderson's gone, Flair was out for ages with his bad shoulder, and he's only back because he spent all his money. Rick cuts Six off by saying the Nature Boy knows how bad Waltman is, so Rick's just gonna walk away from this one. Flair then gets in a cheap shot and Six gets floored. Benoit comes out to provide backup and Six says this kind of shit wouldn't be happening if Scott Hall and Kevin Nash were around, apparently they haven't arrived at Nitro yet. That's how it ended, so there was no announcement made in regards to the Horsemen. The WWF put on an extended video package looking at Dude Love while Nitro puts on two matches, The Great Muda vs The Giant and Dean Malenko vs Steve Mongo McMichael. The Dude Love stuff honestly feels more like a recap video. This is all stuff we learned from the Jim Ross interviews, although there's extended footage used from Mick's college days and the first glimpses the world ever got of Dude Love. McMahon says Dude Love represents Mick Foley's dreams of earning respect and receiving adulation from the fans. Mick tried before in the WWF but he failed miserably. Cactus Jack was somewhat successful but that success came at the cost of disfigurement. Mankind represents the emotional anguish Foley held on to for not receiving the praise and respect he should have as Cactus Jack, and Dude Love, who just debuted last week, finally got respect from both the fans and his peers by coming out and winning the tag titles with Stone Cold Steve Austin. The question now though, will Dude Love hang around or will Mick Foley revert back to the Mankind character? A nice little recap here, but again, nothing we haven't seen before. On Nitro, The Great Muda vs The Giant sure does sound interesting, but let me tell you exactly what happened. Muda tries a few drop kicks, The Giant won't go down. Muda then runs into a choke slam attempt, we see the green mist, and the referee calls for the bell. DQ finish in about 51 seconds. I was interested in seeing this one too, but thankfully they have another match next week. Vincent and Randy Savage run down and they do a number on the big man. Giant manages to break free and then Lex Luger comes down to check on his best buddy. The Giant's blind so he goes to chokeslam Luger, but Lex screams and the Giant ends up setting the total package down. The whole thing ends with Lex trying to wipe the mist off the Giant's face. Dean Malenko and Steve McMichael got way more ring time. Mongo starts off with a shoulder block followed by a hip toss, but he misses an elbow drop immediately afterwards. Dean tries a sunset flip from the top, but Mongo counters with a punch to the head and Dean also falls victim to a Steve McMichael power slam. While Mongo continues to dominate the match and Dean bumps around the ring, Larry Sabisco says on commentary, in regards to Deborah, that women are like elephants, they are great to look at but you don't want to own one. There's absolute silence at the commentary table after Larry says this, and then Tony says those comments are from Larry Sabisco, clearly covering his own ass. Dean hits a German suplex and Mongo takes all the impact on his left shoulder. Mongo then shakes it off and he pulls off a, a, a unique move, and then Double J and Deborah come down to the ring. Mongo chases Jared around, but Jeff manages to drop Mongo over the top rope. Malenko then hits a drop kick in a small package, and Dean Malenko wins the match. Mean Gene wants to know why Dean would associate himself with arseholes like Deborah and Jeff, and Jeff says Dean Malenko recognizes winners. Jeff wants to know if Dean would like to join forces so both men could watch each other's backs. The horsemen are all jealous of Double J, and Dean has his own problems with Eddie Guerrero, so this partnership could benefit both men. Dean says he isn't stupid and he knows there's strength in numbers, and Deborah just blabbers on about how she knows a winner when she sees one and all that shit. Malenko says he'll give Jared an answer when he's good and ready. Imagine Jeff Jarrett asking you to be his best friend. Fuck off, Jeff. Hector Guerrero tries to get some revenge for Chavo on Nitro when he faces brother Eddie, and on Raw we have a triple threat tag match. The Blackjacks vs the Godwins vs the Headbangers. In the Raw match, three men had to be inside the ring at all times and a competitor is only allowed to tag in their partner, and you can tell right away why the WWF weren't very keen on doing more of these kind of matches. 
it's messy and at times the guys involved aren't sure what to do. You get two guys helping each other out, they then attack each other, and the process gets repeated over and over again with tags getting made every now and then too. That's not to say the triple threat tag matches don't work, they definitely do, but the WWF weren't sure how to put one together well in 1997. It ends with the headbangers missing the stage dive thanks to Bradshaw countering the setup, and while this happened, Blackjack Wyndham got hit with a slop bucket. Too many charisma vacuums in the ring though, the Godwins and the new Blackjacks have nothing going for them in terms of character, while the Headbangers had something going on at least with their mannerisms and what have you, it's just a shame they've been jobbed out over these past few months. Anyway, this victory gives the Godwins a tag team title shot next week on Raw. The Guerreros start off extremely fast and it's impressive as fuck, but then Hector almost falls over the top rope and Eddie has to rush over to save his brother. <laughs> if we watch in slow motion, we can see Hector didn't grab the rope with his right hand. Eddie lays in a few boots as punishment for this little mishap, and after a chase around the outside, the brothers do a little roly poly in the ring. Hector pins Eddie, and Eddie decides to get out by biting his brother's arm. Listen to Hector's cell job. It's great work here from Hector Guerrero. Eddie then has a bite on Hector's shoulder, but Hector comes back with a European uppercut in the opposite corner, followed by a superplex. Eddie ends up on the outside again, and Hector pulls off a splash, using the ropes for a little help. But Eddie uses the ropes too, and Hector gets his little gobbledygooker completely wrecked. Eddie then hits a power bomb. He follows this up with a frog splash, and Eddie wins the match. Dean Malenko then surprises Eddie with a snake attack and we see another one of those power bombs with a ridiculous amount of torque. Eddie's just a blur as he gets lifted up to take the move. The crowd goes nuts as Dean applies the Texas Cloverleaf, but Hector wants Dean to stop. Dean won't let go, so Hector forces a break. After getting helped out by his older brother, Eddie repays Hector by throwing him into Malenko and Dean hits a back suplex. Eddie then walks away, and yeah, excellent heel work by Eddie Guerrero. It's amazing how this kind of heel work by Eddie can be so entertaining while other heels in WCW rely on the same old stuff week after week, yet they get paid a whole lot more money. After the match, Mean Gene interviews JJ Dillon. Dylan says the WCW executive committee are working hard to get new talent into WCW, and tonight there's going to be a big contract signing. Stevie Richards then appears and he announces that he signed a deal with World Championship Wrestling. Richards is now officially part of the organization. Dylan wants to know where Raven is. Raven's supposed to sign his contract tonight on Nitro, and Stevie brings Dylan over to Raven, who's sitting in the audience as usual. Richard says he's put together Raven's contract, Raven will get paid almost as much as Richard's, and he'll even get a rental car with a cassette deck for those long drives. Dylan's anxious for Raven to sign the contract, but Raven goes off on more Edgar Allan Poe crap, and I'm actually quoting the Raven nevermore from this point on. All you need to know is Raven's all moody and cool and shit. He talks about the purpose of human existence, how we're all a nation of hollow people, and he rips up the contract. Stevie Richards ends up getting punched in the head and he tells Mean Gene afterwards that he means well. Okerlund wonders if it's a good idea having someone like Stevie Richards putting contracts together for other superstars. Shawn Michaels is going to make a lot of Canadians upset next on Raw while Lex Luger steps in the ring with Scott Norton. This is the one where Michaels pulls off the backflip from the top rope. Bret Hart took exception to this as Michaels was still complaining about knee problems. HBK actually hasn't wrestled since King of the Ring. Sean starts off by saying the people of Canada don't appreciate America. HBK says he has some deep memories of Canada. He remembers getting some toy Canadian army men at Christmas and they all came out surrendering. The crowd are booing Sean relentlessly here, and HBK says the USA keeps from falling into the ocean because Canada sucks. The crowd start chanting a slur at Sean, and Sean says the fans can't be talking about him, that's impossible. HBK continues on by saying he'll join Austin in the flag match later tonight, but he has another announcement to make. Sean says he got on his hands and knees last week and he asked for a chance to be part of SummerSlam. The crowd interrupts Sean by chanting, We want bread. And Sean says the crowd can bet on it, HBK and Hart will be in the same ring together in tonight's flag match. Sean says he wanted to sell tickets or sell merchandise at SummerSlam, but those jobs were taken. Vince McMahon then told him that Earl Hebner has been under the weather recently, so Sean's going to be a special referee at the pay-per-view. 
Sean doesn't work at the bottom of the cards or the middle of the cards. Sean only works in the main event. So when Bret Hart challenges The Undertaker for the WWF title, Sean is going to be the special referee. The boos are deafening and Sean's absolutely loving every moment of it, waving his little flags around and basking in the negative reaction. Sean then says there's a stipulation included in his job. If Sean doesn't call the match down the middle, if he shows any favouritism during the bout, then HBK also won't be allowed to wrestle in the United States, meaning Sean will have to move to Canada by the house next to Bret Hart and wrestle for the Canadian fans every day of his life. Sean ends it by saying if Bret Hart can't trust Sean Michaels, then who can he trust? Absolute heat magnet on this night. This is where Sean's tendencies to be an asshole absolutely pay off. Sean's theme plays in the arena and HBK rubs the Canadian flag on his balls before Raw moves on. The final clue for the million dollar giveaway is up next. So if you watch WWF television for the month, you'd know the four clues are the key to a life of luxury. Or you could just listen to Vince McMahon give you the answer right here. Hey, Jim, you have all four clues, the key to a life of luxury. All you have to do Vincent and Buff Bagwell come down to the ring with Scott Norton. Norton brings Lex to the corner and he doesn't give a clean break. Lex fires back with a hip toss, but Buff Bagwell causes a distraction and Norton takes advantage. Lex then takes a backbreaker. He gets whipped to the corner, but he dodges Norton's running attack and Luger then goes on offense. After hitting a clothesline followed by the bionic forearm, Vincent and Bagwell jump in the ring. And I'm not skipping over any moves here, this is what happened. We don't even reach the 2 minute mark. Vincent gets racked and Buff gets thrown onto Norton. Lex then grabs a microphone. He says, seeing as Hollywood Hogan called him just another name and just another plain old wrestler, then get this. We don't need to wait until Sturgis, fuck's sake. Nobody wants to wait until the pay per views this week on Reliving the War. Hulk comes out and he says Lex will have his day at Road Wild. Hollywood says Lex is nothing but a Hulk Hogan wannabe. Lex is in big trouble, but he's gonna have to get the Road Wild before the match takes place. Backstage, the outsiders arrive, and Conan can't wait to tell Hall and Nash about what happened with Ric Flair and Six earlier on. The Patriot had his Raw debut match next against Triple H while Mortis and Wrath battled Psychosis and La Parka. No sign of Frosty Balls or his best friend tonight, no interference during the tag team match at all. We cut away and see Ric Flair having a conversation with Kurt Hennig and it's made clear that Kurt was supposed to come out and join the Horseman earlier on, but we still don't know if Kurt wants to truly 100% become a Horseman. Back in the ring, Mortis and Wrath won the match with their double team Powerbomb and Neckbreaker. The Parka decided to break a chair over Mortis's back, so Wrath got a little payback by hitting the Parka with a pump kick. A rare occasion on WCW television where you expect interference and it actually doesn't happen. On Raw, we have another match that doesn't truly get underway, just like quite a few Nitro matches this week, but what does happen instead is very noteworthy. The Patriot gets booed out of the building, and even though Triple H is an American too, the fans cheer for Helmsley. A few minutes into the match, the Hart Foundation come out, and Brett's extremely pissed off, with Vince McMahon making Sean the referee at SummerSlam. Brett rips Vince a new one before walking away. He then comes back and he slaps the headset right off Vince's head. That little spot couldn't have been any more perfect, by the way. And then Brett grabs Vince, and Vince fights back. The two push and pull each other while the crowd goes apeshit and it's absolute pandemonium at ringside. The hearts can't pull Brett away from Vince and Jim Ross is screaming for Brett to stop. The cameramen begin falling over and it isn't until the Patriot comes over that Brett finally stops but the Patriot too takes a beating. Brett going after Vince like this was totally unexpected. I remember watching this when it happened and it was great back then too. Nobody up to this point had went for Vince like this on TV and while it doesn't look like much now in comparison to what Vince would eventually do, it was still a great moment. They done this in the right city too, having the crowd go nuts for Brett attacking Vince made it all the better. The stock footage Adventures of Cain is up next while Buff Bagwell takes on Booker T on Nitro. Jim Ross tells Paul to put his money where his mouth is and tell the truth. Paul says he is telling the truth and he says everyone should be able to tell from The Undertaker's reaction that Paul isn't lying. 
Paul has the proof with him tonight on Raw. When The Undertaker and Kane were little, they had a very special bond. The brothers fashioned a small statue and they cut that statue in half. The brothers then made a promise to each other, they made a pledge to each other. As long as they live, they would both keep their own part of the statue. Paul tonight has Kane's half of the statue. It was once a grim reaper, but it's been badly burned of course. Jim Ross says that's all well and good, but it doesn't really prove anything. Ross wants to know when Kane's gonna show up, and Paul says people don't want to see Kane, and people shouldn't force Paul to bring The Undertaker's little brother to Raw. But if Paul's pushed hard enough, he might have no other choice. On Nitro, Shivani thinks it's strange that Stevie Ray didn't come to the ring with Booker T, seeing as Vincent and Norton are with Buff Bagwell, but Tony also says he isn't gonna read into it too much. Buff starts off with a hip toss, he poses to the camera afterwards, he hits another hip toss but he doesn't notice Booker pulling off a spin rooney behind his back, Buff then goes down after a jumping sidekick. Buff slaps Booker across the face, this is just like the Steiners match last week, and Booker gets all fired up. Bagwell gets hip tossed over the top rope and he takes a clothesline on the outside. Buff gets back inside the ropes before Booker and this gives him an advantage. Booker takes a slam on the mat and you can clearly hear Buff tell Booker to get the knees up for the next spot, and Buff then replies by snapping Booker's neck on the top rope. From here, it's all Bagwell. Nick Patrick has words with Buff when he won't stop attacking Booker in the corner. Buff then orders Patrick to count after hitting Booker with a clothesline, and Bagwell accuses Nick of a slow count. The two shove each other, leading to Booker covering Buff, and when Buff kicks out, Patrick rips into Bagwell. Bagwell screams that he's sorry after getting ripped a new one, and Booker comes back into the match with a sweet jumping forearm. But then, the match ending is just as you'd expect. Scott Norton hits a clothesline on Booker from the apron. Patrick was too busy nursing himself after taking an accidental elbow from Booker, and Buff wins the match with the blockbuster. The NWO then attack Booker after the final bell. Stevie Ray does not show up to help his brother. Rey Mysterio cuts a promo on Nitro, and we have Kurt Hennig vs. Michael Wall Street. On Raw, Goldust battles Farouk. Goldust asks Marlena before the match if she has a suitable dress for Brian Pillman to wear after SummerSlam, and she says she does, but Pillman won't fill it out the same way Marlena does. As a matter of fact, Pillman can't fill out his own tights. Shots fired. Someone in the crowd wants the junkyard dog to make a comeback as the two competitors get to work. Goldust hits a par slam, Farouk gets the knees up when Goldust goes for a splash, and then Vince McMahon says on commentary that Bret Hart mustn't have listened to Sean's promo, because Sean pretty much has to be an impartial referee at SummerSlam. After this statement, Vince decides to walk off and leave commentary duties to the King and JR, as Farouk gyrates in the ring. Yep, you heard me right, he's gyrating in the ring. JR says details are sketchy, but it appears Bret Hart and the Hart Foundation just left HBK's locker room and Sean's been injured. Kama pulls Goldust out of the ring, and look at this shit. The referee's looking right at Kama and Goldust, but he doesn't do anything about it. Marlena's screaming at the referee to do something, Goldust gets thrown in the ring, he takes a dominator, and then the referee disqualifies Farouk. Clearly something went wrong here, and it leads to an absolutely flat finish. The crowd boos, Farouk looks pissed off, but he always looks pissed off anyway. And there you have it, semi-main event folks, even Jim Ross said, what the hell's the referee doing? We see a graphic for the flag match, and Ross is uncertain if this thing's even gonna happen now. It sounds like Austin doesn't have any partners, and this feels very similar to last week. On Nitro, Rey Mysterio's on crutches. Apparently Mysterio has a torn ligament, and he's turned down surgery. He says therapy has been helping, but he doesn't know how long he's gonna be out for. He loves pro wrestling, he knows the dangers of becoming a pro wrestler, but he doesn't fear injuries, and he doesn't fear guys like Conan. Conan shows up and he's being a total dick to Ray. He kicks away Mysterio's crutches and he says he has a new family, the NWO. It looks like Conan's about to attack Ray again, but a few luchadors come out to back Ray up. Four heel luchadors show up, and I thought this was a good move bringing out four bad guys. It shows that this NWO stuff goes beyond heels and babyfaces. Ray says Conan doesn't know the first thing about family. Conan says the Wolfpack has his back and Ray closes the promo by telling Conan that he's gonna pay. 
Kurt Hennig versus Michael Wall Street was up next, and it's a 50 second match. And you know, I don't think for a single moment these short matches are by design. It feels like WCW's been overbooking their shows recently, and they realize at the last minute that they're running out of time. Kurt hits the perfect plex after absolutely nothing of note happens in the ring. It's confirmed that Hennig will face DDP at Road Wild just as Kurt hits his finisher, and then Dallas shows up from the crowd just as Kurt wins the match. Page gets in the ring, he goes to work on Hennig, we think Kurt has it all under control when Page gets hit with a knee lift, but DDP counters a perfect plex with a diamond cutter. Shivani says we better believe Hennig will reply to this in the run up to Road Wild. Alright, time to close out the show with a few more matches. It was announced earlier that the Outsiders will face Benoit and Flair in the main event, and it's announced during the entrances that the tag team titles are on the line. On Raw, the flag match goes ahead as planned. So our tag team match is happening on Nitro, all because Six was talking shit and he got clocked by the Nature Boy. Our match starts off with the Nature Boy making easy work of Scott Hall, Scott bumps all around the ring for Rick, and then Scott takes a break on the outside. Benoit gets tagged in and Scott's bad luck continues. Hall gets taken down with a dragon screw and Chris follows this up with a northern light suplex. Scott decides it's already time to tag out and Nash wants Flair. The nature boy gets tagged in, Nash no sells a chop, and Kevin then shoves Flair down to the mat with force. Nash brings it to the corner where Flair takes the back elbows, Nash chokes Flair with his big boot, but then Rick targets the leg and this keeps Nash at bay. Flair tries a flurry of punches, but this ends with Nash grabbing him by the throat and pushing him away. Nash then hits a sidewalk slam after Six gets in a cheap shot from the apron, and Hall comes back in to hit a fallaway slam on Slick Rick. The Outsiders then cheat while the referee's distracted, they enter the ring at will without tagging, they use the ropes to choke Rick, Six even slaps the nature boy around a little, and Rick needs to tag out and let Benoit take over. Nash kicks Flair as Rick tries to crawl to his corner. Flair then gets hit with snake eyes and Hall lands a clothesline afterwards from the apron. Benoit protests in the corner but the outsiders are playing the game way better than the horsemen tonight. Hall comes back in, he slaps Rick around a little, but then Flair surprises Scott and we see a sleeper. Scott quickly counters it with a sleeper of his own, but then Rick hits a back suplex and the nature boy now has a chance to get Chris back in. Flair makes the tag and Chris cleans house. Hall and Nash get taken out and Chris throws Kevin into Scott. Six tries to stop Benoit from hitting the diving headbutt, but Flair pulls Waltman away and Six gets thrown into the guardrails. Chris hits his finisher on Hall, but Nash breaks up the pin. Nash then goes for the jackknife, but Chris fights his way out. Hall then distracts Chris, Benoit gets hit with a big boot, and the Outsiders win the match. Six applies the buzzkill on Flair, but Mongo shows up seconds later to save the leader of the Horsemen. The Steiners then appear on the entranceway, remember the Steiners face the Outsiders at Road Wild, and Nitro then goes off the air. I'm not mad at all with this main event, actually it was one of the better Nitro main events in recent times. No big NWO running, no massive brawl. The match was decent and it was given a good amount of time. Vince McMahon's in Sean's locker room and yeah, Sean's been hurt again, he won't be wrestling in tonight's main event. Surprise, surprise. Sean asks Vince if he wants a lawsuit because this is happening way too often. Brad Owen and Davey come down to the ring and Brad says the night doesn't go any further until he hears the Canadian national anthem. O Canada plays in the arena, Brad and Owen sing with passion as Davey clearly has other things on his mind right now and there's a roar in the audience when the anthem comes to an end. This crowd has been excellent tonight. Steve Austin comes down to the ring and then Dude Love makes an appearance. It looks like Dude Love and Austin are going to go ahead and start the match, so it's a 3 on 2 advantage to the Hart Foundation. The rules are simple, all you gotta do is grab your country's flag and you'll win the match, and what a great idea this was for a main event too in Canada. Owen and Bulldog throw Foley out of the ring so it settles down to Brett and Austin. Stone Cold takes an inverted atomic drop and he gets sent out of the ring too, and then Dude Love is allowed to enter the match without a tag. We've got Owen and Dude Love in the ring now and clearly not everyone in Halifax is a fan of the hitman. Owen hits an enziguri, he goes to grab the flag but Austin knocks him off the top turnbuckle. Just before we go to commercial break, we hear The Undertaker's theme music playing in the arena, and when we come back, the WWF Champion has joined Austin and Dude Love. Davey was in the ring, but he quickly tags out. Owen and Brett stop Dude Love from grabbing the flag, 
In Do Love decides to tag in The Undertaker. The Phenom is all fired up and Owen gets destroyed. Davey tries to help his brother-in-law but The Undertaker makes quick work of the British Bulldog before Owen gets choked out. Owen then takes a choke slam. Undertaker covers Owen. And Brett smacks the dead man for being a silly shit. You gotta get the flag there, big man. Austin gets tagged in and it looks like Owen has Austin's number. That's until Austin hits a clothesline and he lets the Canadian fans know exactly how he feels about them. Austin then performs a chin lock while looking at the bulldog dead in the eyes. Austin even cheats and Dude Love lends a hand. Davey's fucking sweating bullets at the moment. And then Owen fights out but he takes a knee to the midsection. That chin lock hurt Davey more than it hurt Owen. Dude Love's back in the match. Owen counters a neckbreaker with a DDT. But Steve Austin stops Owen from tagging out. Foley tries to apply the mandible claw after getting Owen locked in a body scissors. Owen again has to fight out but a rake to the eyes allows Foley to tag Austin back in and Owen just needs to get to Davey or Brett. The IC champ counters a Steve Austin superplex attempt but he can't tag out. We take the final commercial break as Austin brings Owen to the opposition's corner. And when we come back, Owen counters a sleeper with a back suplex. Owen then hits a spinning wheel kick on Dude Love. Austin comes back in and Owen misses another insecurity attempt. But the King of Hearts pushes Austin away during a sharpshooter attempt and a clothesline puts Austin on the mat. Finally, Bret Hart gets a tag and the audience completely lose their shit when Bret hits a clothesline on Stone Cold. Foley saves Austin from a figure four around the ring post and Austin tags The Undertaker. Taker hits Bulldog with a choke slam and he goes for a tombstone. But Brett puts a stop to that and both The Undertaker and Brett go down after a double clothesline. It's then a race to see who can get their flag first. It looks like Taker's gonna get Old Glory first but Brian Pullman appears and Taker gets hit with a low blow. Brett then grabs the Maple Leaf and the Heart Foundation win the match. There's a big celebration in the arena just before Raw goes off the air. Austin looks incredibly pissed off as the Heart Foundation, minus Jim Neidhart strangely, celebrate in the audience. And oh well done Davy Boy Smith, 5 whole weeks without a chin lock, he'll get a little bronze medal soon if he keeps this up. A very good main event from Raw with a gimmick match that really fit the theme of the show and the current main storyline of the company. Both Raw and Nitro had good main events this week. Raw wins this week's episode of Reliving the War. These Canadian shows are just so fun to watch. And again, the crowd truly makes these episodes more special. For those who attended any of these Canadian shows in 1997, give yourself a pat on the back. Unless it was Survivor Series. Nitro can't keep putting on 30 second, 1 minute and 2 minute matches. It's a classic case of quality over quantity and while WCW have a roster that are very capable of putting on proper showcase matches, they aren't getting a chance to do so on Monday nights. Raw now has 40 points, Nitro has 41, fuck it's close, and we're still on 12 ties. In the television ratings, there's confusion. It's been reported that Nitro got a good rating somewhere in the 3.7 or 3.8 range, while Raw got tons of eyeballs on their show with an excellent 4.1. However, these shows didn't go head to head. The Nitro score is also inconsistent across various reports, but it does look like Raw got more viewers this week. We don't count it as a Raw ratings victory because it wasn't head to head. Next week on Nitro, we have DDP vs 6. The Giant vs The Great Muda and Randy Savage vs Scotty Steiner in our main event. On Raw, Davy Boy Smith has an arm wrestling match against Ken Shamrock, Dude Love and Steve Austin take on the Godwins, and Bret Hart wrestles the Patriot while Shawn Michaels provides commentary. That never works out well, does it? Thanks for watching Reliving the War, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode and take care.